So we started with a paper. Um, this paper is uh, by Jerem Martin, it's the first author and colleagues. Um, you will see um, that uh, this, uh, this paper is quite a technical, complicated immunology single cell RNA-seq paper. It's about Crohn's disease, which as you know, is an inflammatory disease, and specifically about ileal Crohn's disease, which is um, inflammation in the end of the small intestine. This paper is from the lab of uh, Efrain Kenigsberg, and along with many such types of genomics papers, it's wonderful in that it shares not just uh, the results in the manuscript, but the raw data. And so what we're going to do today is show you how to access the data from this manuscript. And I think it's quite amazing with modern technology, we're going to process from, the scr from scratch, from the raw data uh, that's online, um, not the whole data set because it's quite large, but in about 30 minutes, we're going to go and take one of the samples from the raw reads, the raw data that was produced, all the way to a fairly complete analysis that we will see is concordant with the main paper. But what we kind of hope to impart with you today is the idea that you can actually, what, with the notebook that we're going to share with you, not only can you run it, but it's very easy for you to explore the data by yourself, even if you don't have a lot of experience in coding or in R. Um, it's pretty easy to ask questions and learn something new, and we'll try to do a little something new with the data today. Uh, something old, something new, and I'm going to be writing um, in blue. Okay, so let me... Um, Get, say one other thing. The, I'm sharing my screen where I, I hope you can all see a PDF. Um, uh, there's separately, uh, this PDF is simply a printout of, um, of this notebook, Crohn lesion uh, R dot uh, PYMB is a file. Uh, if you click on this file, um, it's in, in GitHub, but there's a button called Open in Colab, which I've just pressed. And now, I'm, I've done something that's very counterintuitive. It's a service Google launched only about maybe one to two years ago, but I've actually launched this notebook in the cloud on a machine that's essentially clean and brand new, where I'm going to install on a blank slate all the software to analyze the data. I'm going to move the data to this machine. I'm going to run a whole analysis on a brand new machine that I got for free from Google. Now you can load any notebook onto this machine and you can load Python notebooks and R notebooks and uh, today we're gonna do one in R. So I'm gonna pause for a second to take any questions uh, if there are any questions from anybody yet. Great. So one thing, we also sent a link to the notebook in the chat. So if you copy and paste that link, um, it'll take you to the screen that Lior is looking at. And maybe Lior, if you wanna walk through how to start the notebook as well. That'd be great. Yes, we're going to do that in a second. Um, uh, we, let me do that in a minute. First, I just want to say a few things about the nature of the notebook. It's been uh, written by Lambda to uh, be really self-explanatory. There's a lot of material in here. Let's not, let me not joke around. This is months to really learn and become expert in all the detail that's inside this one notebook. But uh, we've taken great care to clarify and delineate the preliminaries prerequisites. So if you go to the notebook, you'll see that there's a list of materials, um, creating and manipulating vectors, that sort of thing. Um, they common things in R. If you've never taken an R course before and you'd like to learn, there's some links here about where to start. Um, but there's a few prerequisites. Um, if you, the point being that everything else we've tried to make self-explanatory. Um, so here's, let me start the notebook right now so that it's running while we do um, the tutorial today. I clicked on the menu, um, I click on runtime, and I click on run all. Let's see, so that launched a window telling me that Google didn't write this notebook, that's fine. Um, I'm going to click run anyway. And what's just happened is that on this machine, the commands in this notebook have started to run. Okay, and that's an amazing thing. In the cloud, 
if I click on this uh, up here in the corner, you'll see the specs on my machine. It's uh, uh, got a little, like about 12.7 gigs of RAM, uh, a bunch of disk, um, and the little three green dots mean the machine is up and running and it started to run this notebook. Now the text doesn't do much, but um, as we start going down here, uh, you'll start to see that there are, um, here there's a circle with a little widget circling around. That's happening right now as I speak. And the little blue um, mark right above it where it said skipping install of this and that is a command that was already run while after, since I started. So what I'm going to be doing today is walking you through this notebook as it's running and showing you what the commands are doing and discussing the general steps and you know, thoughts that go into constructing an analysis like this, um, giving you basically an overview that then you can take and by yourself um, you know, play with and modify the notebook. I'm hopeful that you can all open this notebook right, right now on your computers. All you need is a Google account and, uh, and run it. And you know, um, it should, in theory, uh, be uh, the case that all of these notebooks will run. Last time we tried this, we had a little bit of a challenge, I think because of the, um, the source we were grabbing the data from got, you know, a um, hundred requests at the same time uh, and was a bit overwhelmed. If it doesn't work right now for you, you, you can just watch me and then go do it afterwards. Uh, but, but the notebook should run every time. It's really great that this is completely reproducible uh, not, the machine is a blank slate every time. The installation is, dis, is described in these commands. So there's, um, uh, so there's no um, variability in terms of those things. Now, um, uh, somebody just asked me a question um, on the private chat, which I'll answer, but I'd just like to ask that please post the questions um, uh, to either Lambda or Sina uh, or in the public channels. So one of the questions, so the question that was asked was, uh, how would we cope with large data sets? And the answer is, I'll get to it in a minute in more detail, is that uh, the software that we use to process the data sets uh, can stream the data, which means that you don't need to actually download all the data to the machine in the cloud. This makes it possible to process arbitrarily large data sets subject to the Google constraint that I think the machine per instance persists for a day. Um, but but, uh, but you'll see that it's quite fast. Um, and so it is completely tractable to analyze essentially any current public data set uh, from your know, typical experiment. Um, there really is no size limit in terms of the raw reads. Now, after you process um, the data, um, then you have a much smaller amount of information and, and that's fine. Um, one more person asked how you run the notebook. So you go to the Colab research page which you launch from um, uh, this uh, website. Um, I'm, I'm not, let me try to go back there. So we have, um, somebody just asked how to run the notebook again. And I guess um, I'll just open a new, uh, well, I won't open a new window. I'll have like Sina post the link again, but you open a, a, this link to Colab Research. Once you get here, you go to the menu uh, the, you, you go to the run all and then you uh, select that and then you click run anyway, which I'm not going to do because my notebook is running right now and I don't want to pause it. Okay, so let's start talking about what the notebook is doing. And to do that, I'm going to go into uh, notability here where I have a PDF of the notebook so that I can write on it, which is hopefully um, helpful and uh, not just running in real time, but my, my browser window is still running the notebook as I speak. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about the paper. Let's not forget that it's very dangerous and unethical to process data without understanding what it is. Um, it, we have, you know, there's an actual paper here. Um, it's a lot to go through the whole paper right now, but you need to do that if you're going to play with the data. Um, I will say that um, I've highlighted, um, let me uh, highlight this um, section right here. Uh, we've written a very brief description, although 
Ideally, you will go and look at the actual abstract of the paper. Let me scroll all the way to the top of it, sorry. Um, uh, this paper looking at Crohn's disease, the idea was to take lesions and then adjacent tissue and do single cell on both to try to find gene markers um, that are associated with these lesions. And you'll see that, um, that they found a subset of patients expressed unique cellular modules in inflamed tissues. Um, I think this is a really interesting kind of uh, data set because it shows the power of single cell RNA-seq to zero in on specific cell types in affected tissue in any kind of disease. This would be one example. Um, and uh, so from the point of view of the tutorial today, our goal is going to be to sort of look at the cell types we find in one of the samples, not all of them, and try to like identify how you, uh, you know, what the markers are that are specific so that to the cell types so that you can get an idea of how this works. We're not going to go through processing all the data and comparing, um, you know, the lesions to adjacent tissue and identifying the specific patients that are different. All of that is very interesting and very simple, honestly, with, with the same tools. Uh, once you load up all the data, it will just take longer. So that's the paper we're talking about. Um, so let me go into, um, back into the notebook. Um, once you have a data set you're interested to analyze, there are several tools that you will use. Um, in this notebook, we've used some tools, which I'll talk about, and I'll talk about why we picked these tools and not others. Um, uh, you need to start by making a kind of high level choice about whether you'll work in Python and R. And honestly, I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. Um, some people prefer one language over another because of their background or their expertise. Um, I will say that R has a really strong and tight-knit community in bioinformatics specifically that's very supportive, and very helpful. So if you have questions, um, you can get help there. And Landa um, is, uh, uh, you know, one of the, uh, is, a, is a person in this community who's an expert um, and is always hel helpful and, and available to answer questions, not just on this tutorial, but generally. Um, Python is a, a really broadly supported language, um, less aimed purely at statistics like R is, um, but again, really you can do basically the same things in both languages. Um, and there, you know, there's more technical differences that I won't get into today, but if you're a, be a beginner, um, you need to pick one or the other just to start. If you're actually going to be working in bioinformatics longer term, uh, you will have to learn something about both because you'll be collaborating with others and, and people use um, both languages. So the first thing we're going to do is install packages. Remember, this machine was a clean slate. And in R, um, it's, it's quite straightforward to install packages. Um, there's uh, install, I'm sorry, let me go to my friend. There's an install packages command. Uh, let me try to be a bit neater. Um, that, that is used. If I scroll down a little bit, um, you'll see that uh, after checking the time so that we can just measure how long the notebook takes to run, um, we write some commands that install some packages. Now, in single cell RNA-seq, if you're using R, there's a very popular, essentially, I would say community standard for analyzing your data um, in, in a package that's called Surat. Um, it's from the Satija lab at the New York Genome Center. Um, it's a, it's a well-written package that has a lot of functionality to do almost anything you would want to do in single cell RNA-seq. It's named after the painter Surat, who you may remember um, drew pictures using little dots um, so it ends up looking a lot, um, uh, you know, like stepping away, you see a picture. So the little dots here are cells. Now, one of the things about Surat is that it's a very comprehensive package. So loading it actually takes a long time. Um, in the cloud, because we've launched a new machine, it would take you about half an hour to install Surat. Now, if you're working on your laptop or on a server at work, 
you install R once and you install Surat, it takes you an hour or two to get all this stuff set up and then you're good to go permanently unless you're updating packages. But we wanna be able to do this on the cloud. Um, why do we wanna do it on the cloud? Well, we can teach you on the cloud. We can reprocess data easily on the cloud and we can plug in any data set into the cloud infrastructure. So we wanna install packages maybe faster and today um, half an hour is a long time for a one hour uh, tutorial. Um, so Lambda has um, uh, really, for the purposes of today, written a slimmed down version of Surah called Surah Basics, and that's what she's installing. And it basically eliminates all the chaff, if you like, all the stuff that is good to have, but that you don't really use in a typical, really basic analysis. And so um, it's, a, I, th I think, a really nice um, uh, kind of uh, a piece of work that will allow you to really start up and run these notebooks anytime because Surah Basics takes about 10 minutes to install. And that's going to install a whole lot of software from Surat, not the whole thing, but plenty of stuff um, that will allow us to really analyze the data. So that's what's happening in this first command. And the way Colab works, if you've never used it before, is that these boxes show you, um, by these boxes, I mean this box here, they show you the commands. And then underneath here is what was output to the machine when it was run. And so, um, you know, there was some code being downloaded and all this stuff was being installed. A whole bunch of stuff happened, um, uh, you know, for, for the basic installation in R. And R is well done um, in the sense that these packages, um, you know, in turn install dependencies. So this one command installed basically everything we're going to need. Um, uh, this is similar in Python. And if you look at the notebook from a month ago um, on the Lung Atlas project we did, you'll see how it works um, in Python. Um, somebody asked, you know, is there a way to install packages locally and then load them in the cloud? I don't, it's a good question. I'm not sure, but I don't think you can really get away with that um, because you, uh, you need to ultimately install on a new machine uh, what you need. Um, I will say in terms of data that Google Colab allows you to mount Google Drive. And so what you can do is you can have your data on Google Drive, making it very easy to load in your data into your notebook. That is a really nice feature. Um, okay, so um, uh, let me uh, continue here. Um, so you can see that um, install installation, um, you know, didn't take too long. Um, next, we're installing a program called KB. This is a program from my lab. And what it's going to do is actually process the data. Okay, so um, it's going to take the reads and basically do the task of trying to I mean, the reads, of course, in an experiment like this involve having taken cells, um, run them through some assay. In this case, we, uh, the, the, it's, so the assay is um, the 10X chromium technology from 10X Genomics. It's a microfluidics-based method, um, which I won't get into today, but whose net output is a matrix, a table, which has genes by cells. And we're gonna count how many molecules of each type we saw in each cell. Um, and so what KB does is it takes the reads that came um, out of the experiment and tries to figure out which genes they came from so that it can do this counting. In most single cell analyses, this step is a big bottleneck because it involves dealing with what you might think of as the big data part of the experiment. That's where you're looking at huge files with tons of reads from the sequencer. And what's really nice about KB is that it deals in, you'll see two commands. Under the hood, there's a lot of stuff going on, but in two commands, processes the whole data set um, and produces the matrix where then we're gonna analyze and have fun. Um, the way that um, it's installed is by a system command. This kind of just runs a system command on the operating system. Um, it's a Python package, it's kind of interesting where using both Python and R actually in this notebook. And 
The next thing that happens is that um, we're going to create an index for mapping the data um, as human data uh, with this command kbref. For today, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the uh, command line options, although I'm very happy um, uh, to answer um, questions um, if there are any questions. Um, so, um, so, that, so the KB um, uh, gets installed quickly, um, and then the system uh, command calling the ref makes the index um, work very quickly. I will tell you that in KB, we've worked very hard um, to have a lot of defaults. You just specify human here or mouse or any other model. Uh, if you have a non-model, we, we have a simple tutorials for how to build an index. Um, and this index is going to be a data structure, which will make it efficient um, to map the reads. Now, why are we using this program? There's some other programs. 10x Genomics has a program called Cell Ranger. That's a pretty much standard for many people right now. The reason is that on Colab, um, we want to be able to process, as I said, a lot of data. Um, and the standard software like Cell Ranger won't run on the limited hardware that Google Colab uh, provides. And one of the really nice features of KB, which wraps these programs, Callisto and Bus Tools, is that it will run on Colab hardware. It's very low memory. Um, and to my knowledge, the only tool uh, that will perform this kind of analysis that can run on this hardware. So, um, and I think that's important because you can rewrite, like, that's the thing, we can share this and all of you can run uh, this data set right now and learn how to do it. If you really are gonna crank through huge amounts of data, obviously you wouldn't do it in Colab. Um, but KB will install and run on Windows, if you like Windows, on Mac, on, on, on Linux server, um, and has been written to be really universal and portable. So we're almost at 11.30 and we're about to get into the fun stuff. So let me um, just pause and take any questions um, either on the chat, but or, or Sina and Lambda also can take the questions depending on what they are. I think uh, so far so good. Um, Lambda and I have been have been answering questions via the chat. So if you guys have any questions, just feel free to shoot them our way. Great. Okay. Um, I'll wait a second and then I'll keep going on. Great. Okay, so one thing that I don't have time to go through today in detail, but Lambda did a great job in this notebook, is explaining what the code does and what all the packages that are being installed actually do so that if you're gonna try to modify anything, uh, you kind of have a sense of what's going on. And I just wanted to tell you that one of the um, really great things about Colab is that you literally can just go in and change any of these numbers. Some of them are just plotting parameters, colors, text sizes. I would start with that if you've never done this before. You just change them, rerun the notebook, and you can just see how the, you know, how the plot changes. And once you run the notebook once, you don't have to start from the beginning again because the process data is saved to this machine in the cloud for the temporary duration that it's alive. And so you can just rerun one command over and over and over if you just want to play around with it and see what it does. And I'll give you some suggestions of uh, how to do that later. So now comes um, uh, the part about the data. And um, there's a lot of um, knowledge to, to be, um, well, there's a lot of information to impart on how to get data and where to get it. It's a great, great thing about genomics that data tends to be made publicly available, not always, but maybe more so than other fields. And there's a couple, a handful of public databases that are great to learn about that have the, the free data and that you can feed into this notebook. So one of the really nice things is if you want to do another data set, you can use the same commands and just process something else. Um, this data set, if I go back to the top, uh, we have a link. Uh, it's right there. It's called an accession number. It's basically a digital identifier that if you were to click on that link, um, will open a browser showing you uh, where the data is. The issues to talk about though, are that depending on the data set, the format which, which, with, in which it's represented in the cloud may differ. And um, you know, we've written our tools to be able to process different formats. Um, 
some format called BAM and FASTQ. I'm not going to go into um, the entire background on this again, unless there are um, questions. But um, but needless to say, um, it's ideal if you can get the files in FASTQ format. The two databases that we use most often are called the SRA, the Sequence Read Archive, and the ENA, which is the European Nucleotide Archive, which basically they uh, mirrors it, uh, the SRA. Um, the ENA highly recommend because they tend to have more of the data sets uh, downloadable directly in FASTQ format. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, what, um, uh, so what Lambda has done here is create um, a list of the file names, um, which are in the form of URLs where this data is located. And she's constructed these file names and URLs in R. And, but the key command, which will generate the count matrix, which is the key object, is down here in this box right here. Um, and that's running a program called Callisto. It was developed uh, by Nicholas Bray, Paul Melstead, um, with, and, and Harold Pimentel. Um, it's, uh, it was developed initially for bulk RNA-seq, but we have a modified version um, uh, that will process um, single cell RNA-seq. And it will also, using another suite of tools called bus tools written by Sina Buesagis on this call, um, and also with the help of Paul Melstead, will um, will take uh, the the Callisto output and actually perform a series of operations, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, to get you this count matrix. At this point, there's a lot under the hood because single cell RNA seq involves barcodes. You may have heard of. There's reads. There's UMIs. All these things, and um, and this program in this one command is dealing with all of that. Now, the, what we've tried to do is be very transparent and modular. On the one hand, there's a use, a use, a use case like today where you want to just process some data and see how it's done. We just type one command. But you might also, and you should, care exactly how it works and not just take our, our word for it that it did a good thing. And so you can actually un unwind this wrapper and look at all the commands inside and see what it ran and what it did. Um, and they're all just separate commands that are completely modular. Um, if I was teaching a semester course on this, I would go through all of those. I'm not going to do that um, today. So uh, processing one of the samples, remember there's about two dozen samples in this data set, um, uh, but we processed one took about seven to eight minutes. Now this Google Colab machine has two cores. So that gives you a sense that you really can use this machine to get a quick look at your data um, if you just want to plug and play. I'm just going to switch back to the browser for a second. Um, I think I was, where was I, uh, running this code. Um, hopefully I'm well, yes, it's hopefully run all of these commands already. Um, I think that we're here. Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, not quite there. Oh, yeah, we haven't quite gotten to quality controls. We were here at about seven to eight minutes. So yes, all these commands have already run. We're at like a bit over 30 minutes into uh, the tutorial. If you started when we joined and you managed to launch the whole thing and run it, you should be getting your final um, results um, around now. Um, so uh, I'm going to pause again and see if there are questions that I have missed while I'm speaking because I see some things on the chat. Um, uh, any questions, Sina, Lambda, for me, or that you would like to answer? Um, there, not really. Um, so pretty much, I guess, just some general questions. Um, the KB ref command will download an index from a server. Um, and we are working on updating that so the, the, ind the index, which is made from a reference, for example, the human or mouse, is constantly updated. Um, there are some questions about whether one would run this, uh, you know, for example, if someone wanted to do a standard analysis, would, would they recommend doing it on Colab versus on a, like an institutional cluster? Um, and I guess from my experience, the way that I work is I like to set up my notebooks 
on our own server and then port them to Google Colab so that way I can share them with others. And that forces me to be really reproducible um, for my analysis. It has to run from beginning to end. Yeah, it adds a lot of transparency also because you really, really can see um, exactly what's happening. There's no hiding um, anything. Um, and, you know, for me, I'll just say um, I'm a, a PI and I, I'm often working with students and other collaborators and I really like Colab because um, somebody wants to show me a result. Um, it's a lot of overhead for me to go into a machine on my own and start installing everything from scratch. I have a lot of projects I'm kind of involved in. This way I shoot up the Colab notebook and I can even just myself quickly uh, play around. And I mean, it's simple enough that even a PI can do it is what I'm trying to say. So, um, great. Um, Lambda, do you want to just say a word or two about how you use R, like if it's on your laptop or on a server or in Colab generally? Um, um, yeah, um, generally, um, yeah, generally I use R on a server. Um, yeah, our lab has servers, but sometimes I also use it on my laptop. Um, Great. Okay, so let me switch back again to the quality control part. Um, I think this part is where the uh, tutorial can be quite useful, actually. Um, uh, you know, tutorial of this kind. Um, basically in the form of sort of open office hours, because when it comes to any data set in genomics or biology, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of experience that goes into knowing what to look for and how to look for things. Um, again, I can't teach the whole thing today, but in this notebook, we've done a whole bunch of quality control on what came out of Callisto and bus tools. Um, so the first step is to read the gene count matrix into R. And again, what's nice is you have the code here to do that. Um, in, you know, you want to modify it and read another count matrix in. Um, you can just change uh, the file name. You know, you can mount your Google Drive in here easily. Um, and so you could actually start the notebook right here with another data set for which you already have a count matrix. Um, so what kind of quality controls do we do once we have this matrix? Well, you know, the first thing we want to do is look at, you know, how many cells do we have? Um, how many molecules did we detect in each cell? We want to look at those distributions. We want to do some QC to see if there were cells that maybe were damaged during the experiment, got lysed somehow, so we want to discard them from further analysis. We want to look at which genes were highly expressed, just a lot of stuff like that. And the nice thing again is with one notebook like this that's shared, um, uh, you know, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And I will say that Surat has on its own um, website, a lot of really nice tutorials uh, demonstrating analysis. Um, but what's nice here in Colab is you can kind of with time create your own master notebook that has all the different plots you like. And every time you want to pop one up, um, you just load in your data set and you can play with it right away in real time. And you don't even have to be at your computer, right? You could be on the road, on your phone, you could be talking to a collaborator in their office and you're always kind of ready to go. So this data set, um, you know, is looking, um, uh, uh, is looking uh, pretty good um, in the terms of, you know, you see we have a lot of cells, um, we have a lot of genes uh, detected. Um, you know, this dimension of the matrix is the sort of bottom line uh, because it's kind of the barcodes, you know, there's a one barcode associated to each cell. So this is kind of telling you how many measurements uh, you made. However, uh, now starts the kind of pruning part. You'll see we're gonna end up with about 3000 cells um, because there are going to be cells where, which are empty and uh, where we had very few reads. Um, cells where we had a lot of mitochondrial DNA, um, which indicates uh, possibly like damage um, during the experiment. Uh, so various filters will apply. Um, and all the code here is, uh, is there to do it. Um, I'm not gonna today walk through line by line. Um, although if you have questions before the session's over, um, you know, Lambda scene or I can field them. Um, if you have questions after today's workshop, don't despair. You're welcome to ask them uh, to post them as an issue on the GitHub page, and we will respond there. So it's a good way to go about doing that. 
Um, so this plot is a very standard plot, and we've made it here. Um, it's called the knee plot, um, as you'll see. Uh, it says get knee because it looks like uh, a knee, right? Um, and the parent of the, the point of this plot is that um, every dot here um, represents one cell in this experiment. And what you're looking at on the x-axis is um, how many UMIs you identified in that cell. So this fellow right here is just under 10,000. And please excuse my sloppy handwriting. My iPad is not flat, so it's hard to draw. Sorry. So what are we, what is the y-axis? Well, the y-axis is showing you the ranking of that cell in terms of how many UMIs are in it. Let me back up and say that a UMI stands for unique molecular identifier. And because of the PCR step in this protocol, you're going to have many molecules amplified over and over. And there's going to be a, a barcode sequence on each molecule that when it's the same, you can see that it was really one molecule. And so a UMI is a fancy abbreviation for um, um, an individual molecule rather than all its copies that came out of the sequencing experiment. So this cell over here, um, you know, had a little bit over 10,000. Um, uh, a little bit of under 10,000 molecules detected in it. Um, and what you can see is that as we go in this direction, there's kind of this drop off here, this, uh, this horizontal piece where we're now talking in this domain about cells where we detected, you know, one to 10 molecules in the whole cell. That's going to be completely useless in an analysis. And even worse than useless, we want to discard it because it might just uh, you know, um, not not be real data. It might be, um, uh, you know, barcode crossovers that happen. Various art technical artifacts that uh, that we want to ignore. So what happens in these experiments is that you threshold this somewhere, which is to pick a horizontal line, where you take all of the cells underneath here, um, and in this case it's about three thousand. It's a bit of a art rather than a science exactly where you cut off um, and, and uh, there's some automatic ways to do it as well in these software packages um, uh, but in any case we're going to end up with about 3,000 cells um, now i will say one thing that i really again to extol the virtues of this kind of way of working is if you read this uh, this paper um, uh, you know about crohn's disease um, uh, from the Kenigsberg group. It's a very well written paper, but you know, the authors had to make some choices and you might wonder, you know, how the results depend on the choices they made. And that would be a tall order um, in usual circumstances with the paper to go and take the data from somewhere and the raw code, which is in some mass that you got to install. Um, it's very easy in, the, in this kind of work format to just threshold and say, well, let me take more cells or less cells and see whether it really changes the, the bottom line. Um, and that's a, if you're trying to learn uh, how to do these things, it's a very good exercise. I'm not gonna assign it today, but it's a great exercise to actually go through the process of doing that and say, okay, what if I had two, two, what if I took 2,500 uh, cells or what if I took, um, you know, what if I took all 150,000? Does it change the results? You can find out, okay? Um, and, uh, okay, so, um, you know, there's some questions I'm seeing on the chat about whether this is usual or not, and there's actually a statistic here, it's in this notebook that we've computed that's very useful. You can see that in the cells we've captured, we've kind of collected most of the data. Um, so uh, we haven't, you know, discarded uh, too much stuff. Okay, so, um, so that's uh, the first kind of like basic QC. The next thing you wanna do is figure out like if there are low quality cells. Um, we're going to uh, look at mitochondria in a second. Um, but first I wanna talk about a library saturation analysis, which we personally really like to do with every one of these experiments. All right, let me pause and say one thing, that nothing is, um, is holy scripture in these notebooks, okay? So I first, you know, we filtered here on this knee plot and now we're gonna look at some other filters and 
you should ask and be critical and say, why you do it in that order? And again, the challenge to you is don't. I mean, take these notebooks. You can do it even right now before this um, tutorial ends and just switch, uh, switch the order around and find out for yourself whether it matters or not. Okay, that's the only way to go about doing it. Okay, so a really key question that people often have and ask me um, before they do their experiments is, you know, how many reads should I sequence? And um, there's some plots you can make, um, which are both QC plots, but also experimental design plots in a way. Um, you can see here on the x-axis in this plot is, you know, again, every dot is a cell. This is how many molecules were detected. And this is how many genes were detected. Now, the thing is, in a typical cell, there, you know, in, in a human, like in this kind, I'm not, you know, sure exactly uh, in the, uh, in the ileum, but you know, you'd expect typical cells to have a few hundred thousand transcripts or molecules in them. Now, a technology like 10X does not measure all of those by any means. Only a small fraction get collected and assayed. So you might actually wonder, you know, if you've saturated um, the measurement of all the molecules in the cell. Now, there's two things I want to say here. Number one, we're not measuring directly molecules and cells. We have a whole complex assay to generate a cDNA library. So only a small fraction of, of, of molecules are in that library. And then on top of that, in the sequencing phase, we're sampling from that library. So, um, so your question might be, you know, if I were to sequence more from my library, would I detect more? Um, and, you know, what you might expect is that initially you detect more and more. Um, and eventually you saturate out, right? Uh, because you're now detecting molecules that are distinct molecules, but from the same genes you've already seen. This goes back to a very classical thing in statistics uh, by the famous statistician Ari Fisher, who uh, collaborated with a, a field biologist uh, to sample butterflies. And the question is, you know, you keep sampling, like, am I, how many, when I estimate, like, how many more species am I going to see? I mean, eventually, you're just seeing the same butterflies over and over and over again. So, um, so these plots are very useful to make. And you can see that in this particular data set, uh, we're really far from saturation. Um, and uh, it's possible that if we sequenced more, we would detect more. Um, and often, if you've got the library in the freezer, you can go back and do that. So, hey, Lior, could we have a repeat explanation of the inflection point again? It seems like there's a little bit of confusion about how one would set a cutoff. Should cutoffs be set for different samples together or separately, and the reasons behind different cutoffs? Those are great questions. Um, and uh, usually, the best way to do this um, is to do it sample by sample, um, except for the fact that. There are now several technologies for multiplexing different samples in one droplet microfluidics assay. So, you know, in, 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 in 10x, for example, in this technology, um, you run a lane of 10x means you will measure about 10,000 cells, uh, maybe 8,000, maybe 5,000. But you can now multiplex the samples, basically tag them, either with antibodies to, surface cell, to cell surface proteins or chemically different assays to do that. And you can pool different samples in one lane. If you did the latter, you might wanna draw this new plot from everybody together. But typically, even then, you might wanna do it sample by sample because um, you may have biases that are species specific. You may have mixed different species in your experiment. So it's very hard to give a generic answer. Um, the other thing is, you know, where exactly do you pick the point? Um, I mean, it really is an art. So, um, you know, some people are more conservative. Um, they tend to try to like pick not too many cells uh, so that they have a lot of uh, read depth in them. Others pick a lot. Um, some people, and I'll just be frank, manipulate uh, a little bit by these choices because you know, when you report in your paper how many molecules you detected per cell, you know, if you thresholded, um, you know, if you thresholded closer to the right-hand side here, your, your stat summary is going to look a lot better in that regard. Um, so, 
uh, there's no hard and fast answer. And there's some methods that just look at the derivative here and then try to find out where it's, um, you know, where it's transitioning. Um, so I, I don't have a, a good answer for you. You know, it's the sort of thing that um, is just basically uh, best done on a case by case basis right now. Um, the real solution to this is for the technologies to improve and not have these artifacts that lead to these um, not so well assayed cells. Okay, so let me go um, continue here. Uh, I think I was down here um, and talk about um, mitochondrial counts. Um, uh, so uh, as I said previously, a high percentage of mitochondrial uh, content in a cell can be an indication that there was a cell burst during sample prep. Um, and that's because the cytoplasmic transcripts are, you know, more easily uh, degraded um, and lost. So this is a kind of QC that one can do. Um, and you can see the, the plot down here. Um, you know, I'll try to zoom in a little bit on the screen so you can see it clearly. Um, again, each dot here is a cell. You can see that there's some not so good cells. A lot of the content is, is fine. Um, Note of warning here, in some experiments, the mitochondrial um, cell uh, content might, first of all, be of biological interest. Um, and different types of cells naturally have varying amounts of mitochondria uh, transcripts that you would detect. So again, there's no hard and fast rule. And I've, I've done a personal little um, a kind of, uh, uh, I have a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, annotating for a bunch of papers I've read with the thresholds they used, and it's all over the map. You know, some papers it's 25%, 3%, 2.5%. In some papers, it's a different percent for each sample in the, in the paper. Um, so again, I think more important than the exact threshold is for you to play around when you're doing your analysis and determine that your primary results are not so dependent on the threshold. And secondly, to be transparent, I have a notebook like this where anybody can go and see exactly what you did. I really, really dislike papers, and there are many of them, that give you the final answers and even maybe some code to generate some final figures, but where this stuff is nowhere to be found. Because then I don't know what choices were made and whether they were good or bad. Um, this particular analysis had another filter uh, going on, which is the removal of epithelial cells um, and, uh, and red blood cells, and that has to do with what they're looking for in this particular experiment because they're interested in Crohn's disease and they're interested in specific cells uh, from the ileum that they've extracted and they just don't want to have contamination from certain cells that, that are hard to sort of uh, not carve out uh, in the prep. Um, and so they did this filter and, um, you know, we're, we're just can we can redo all of this analysis and really not it's not just about checking but um, uh, but you know we could analyze now these cells um, and see you know just just because um, so and I will tell you that at the end of the day um, in our analysis we actually have uh, more cells uh, than they did um, you know by our uh, a little bit more um, uh, than what they did um, there's a nice uh, uh, plot looking at hemoglobin count. Um, and so all of this basic QC ends typically with a plot like this, which is, um, is showing you kind of the, the distribution of uh, counts in your cells um, uh, and the distribution uh, of, of genes detected in your cells. Basically, so you know, you have a couple of outliers, uh, but in a nice thick uh, band to work with. Again, I'm already almost at an hour and I don't want to go uh, too long today because soon I'm, I'm cutting in on lunch on the West Coast. But I will just say that all the commands are here, uh, everything to make all these plots, all these filters. You can filter by other genes. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can change the percentage. And if you're serious about learning to do this, it's a really great idea to, again, I've said this many times now, is just play with these thresholds and see what happens. Um, I'm going to pause for one more second um, to take a, another sip of water and see if there are any questions and if Lambda and Sina want to say anything. 
think we got we got the questions all covered. But to okay. emphasize what Lior said, I really do believe the best way to learn is by doing. And so going in and playing around with the different thresholds uh, can be really a really nice way to to figure out the different kinds of effects that different values can have. Um, um. Uh, yeah, so there's a question. Yeah, I'm just about to answer it, but um, yeah, it says, um, do you recommend to remove ribosomal genes from the downstream analysis if they are not the focus of the study? Go ahead, Lambda, please go and answer. Yeah. Um, okay, so one thing is that um, for um, when we did a benchmark um, comparing Callisto and Cell Ranger uh, downstream analyses, uh, Callisto tends to, so compared to Cell Ranger, Callisto results tend to have like uh, the ribosomal genes severely, um, severely um, depleted. So I think, um, uh, yeah, they're pretty ubiquitous and if you don't care about them, suppose you can remove them. Okay, so let me, uh Keep going. I'm going to talk now. So now is when you get into a very important phase of analysis that's uh, to just look at the data, um, by which I mean really explore the structure of the data set. Um, so there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of genes that, you know, 30,000 genes, I think, in this data set that we're measuring expression of. So you should imagine um, you know, if you had two genes, you could make a plot where you have a 2D plot and uh, maybe I'll draw it, you know, something like this. And this is gene one and this is gene two and every dot is a cell and you're seeing how much you have of gene one and gene two. Um, uh, what we can do here um, is uh, try to make a plot like that for this data that's really in 30,000 dimensions. And, you know, I, I started my career in mathematics. Um, and thinking in 30,000 dimensions is very difficult. And, you know, as biologists now, we are being asked to do exactly that. And so this is a part of the analysis that requires really a lot of experience and thought because it's very, very easy to fool yourself uh, when you're trying to think about something in 30,000 dimensions uh, in 2D. You can even think about 3D objects. And, you know, if you've ever seen these puzzles where you have to untangle stuff, it, it can be pretty hard. Um, so 30,000 dimensions is, is very difficult. And, and, and you know, a lot of um, intuition that you might have about 2D doesn't work in 30,000D. 30, so a key tool um, that's used is PCA, uh, is a method that's used to, um, to examine the data. PCA is called principal component analysis. You'll learn about it in linear algebra. And what it's trying to do is, if you just think going from 3D to 2D, is taking a bunch of points in 3D and smashing them down, projecting them. Just think about a shadow from a flashlight. So you're just trying to figure out where to point the flashlight as you're going to smash them down into 2D so that the variability, which can be technically defined as the variance, um, in 2D is maximized. So you imagine if you have a bunch of points in 3D that spread out along some line, you're going to want to represent them in such a way that you see that line as opposed to an orthogonal shadow where everything collapses to one dot. So that's what um, PCA will do. Um, and, you know, if you go down to 2D, you can actually look at a picture and that's what we're looking at down here. Um, each dot layer here started with 30,000 dimensions and now you're looking at it in some flashlight projection down to 2D. Uh, where this is, if in some sense, the maximal shadow. But actually, typically in single cell RNA-seq, uh, we use many more dimensions because there's a way to measure how much information you're losing uh, each time you drop a dimension. If you want to think about it differently, this y-axis here is showing how much of the variability in the data you're actually explaining when you go down to 2D. You see, this is sort of the most variable shadow, but there's actually information you're not seeing that if you were to go to 3D, you would actually capture a whole bunch of extra variability. So in this particular data set, you know, you can see that for the first couple of dimensions, uh, you're capturing a lot of variability in the data, but then eventually at some point, um, out 
you know, past 50, 100 dimensions, um, they're, they're, there's not much structure in the more in the data. You basically have noise. So this is a very um, important concept because um, one way to think about this is that in a typical experiment, you know, in theory, single cells could behave arbitrarily where every gene is expressed differently in every cell in some arbitrary way. But what these pictures are showing is that's, that's not true. That what's actually the case is that there are certain subsets of genes, certain directions in the data, um, where these directions are dominant in explaining what the data looks like. So the data is not arbitrary. It's um, there's not 50 genes, but 50 combinations of genes that are relevant to explaining basically what's going on. And so I think that's a very, you know, very interesting aspect of something we've learned from single cell RNA-seq is that although in theory, things might have been very, very complicated in reality. Um, and then, you know, it's not so surprising because in reality, cells obey uh, gene programs where a transcription factor um, binds to a promoter and turns on some gene and that gene interacts with another gene and they're basically networks of genes and they're all doing stuff together and it's not completely arbitrary what's going on. So these are very important plots to make. Um, and, uh, uh, and so again, you know, I'm not gonna go, maybe I'm already into one hour. Um, In there, uh, we got a good question. Yes, go ahead, sorry. Um, the question is about uh, projections and using PCA versus Tisney UMAP and maybe some combination of the, of the few. Okay, great question. Um, so PCA is usually used as a preliminary step prior to maybe the 50 dimensions, prior to the visualizations that you're more used to seeing, which we're gonna see at the bottom of this notebook. I won't scroll down there, but we're gonna to get to them in a second. Um, such as you just mentioned, TSNE or UMAP. Um, it's very interesting that in machine learning, um, which this is part of, because this data could be any data, you know, you could be looking at frequencies of words on Twitter or, or whatever. Um, the, these tools to visualize the data are commonplace. It's quite a unique use of PCA first and then coupled to TSNE or UMAP or other techniques afterwards. That is not so commonly done. If you actually look at the first TSN, at the TSNE paper itself, they didn't do that. Um, and it's, it seems to be a very good thing to do because the PCA basically removes noise. And if you, re, you know, because there's variability in the measurement itself. So that variability is basically present in all these, you know, high PCs, which when you cut them out, it's kind of like a, a digital filter um, that zeroes in on the important information. And if you don't do the PCA first, and I encourage you to try it with this notebook, I've done that, it's really fun. If you just do the straight out TSNE, you'll find that you, you, know, you don't really see the structure in the data as well as when you first filter out the noise. Um, because the TSNE doesn't know, it's just trying to represent the raw points. And so it is showing you all that noise and it's trying to do it in 2D and it gets lost in the process. So, um, so that's why we typically do PCA first, usually the 20 or 50 dimensions, depending again on the data set, uh, bit of an art, how to decide that. And then we do a further visualization of that denoised data. Okay, so actually somebody asked about TSNE, there it is. Um, so this TSNE um, is, uh, 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 is, uh, uh, is a whole other, um, uh, a whole other process, um, which I, I, I jumped ahead to, but, um, but it also allows you to see clusters in the data. It sort of goes together with the clustering method. So again, every point here is a cell, but it's got a color. And that coloring was done with a method called Leyden clustering. Now, again, I don't have time to tell you about Louvain clustering and Leyden clustering and a hundred other clustering methods that exist. Um, that's time for another course. Um, you can specify parameters in these clustering methods. I would love to encourage you to try them out. Uh, we have many other notebooks uh, on my lab website that you can visit, which have other clustering tools used. And so you can uh, definitely try them out. Um, but you cluster the data and you TSNE it. 
And, uh, and here, uh, just to the point of the question that was previously asked, um, we've, uh, we've first PCA to 20 dimensions. Um, and now looking at those 20 dimensions in 2D, we get a very nice picture and we get clusters of cells. Um, there's another technique called UMAP um, that as noted in this notebook is argued to better preserve structure, although um, it's really beyond the scope of today to discuss all the math um, uh, that goes into this. Um, uh, but you can choose one or the other. You can look at both. Um, you can choose parameters for these visualizations. And I have to say that, again, this is an art where, as an honest scientist, you ought to try a lot of parameters and make sure that you're using that procedure to make sure you're not fooling yourself and overfitting in the data, not to try to cherry pick the best picture that shows the story you wanted to tell. So that, you know, is, is very important. Um, Okay, so, um, so you know, again, at a high level, you do the PCA to 20, 30, 40, 50 dimensions, you do the TSME, you cluster somehow, and you get this picture. I know that probably some of you today have uh, seen um, you know, pictures like this before. Um, you can get used to them and a lot of people mock them, but I think that they're a really special kind of picture to see for the first time if you've never seen one. Because it's amazing that we can go in and do an experiment to just measure RNA content in cells and so remarkably and distinctly identify groups of cells, like this one here or this one here or these, that are so distinct from each other in their transcriptional state that can literally visually see it. It's, I think it's a remarkable thing and it begs the question of what are those clusters of cells? What are they a specific cell type that is characterized by a certain transcriptional signature. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. And so in the old days of bulk RNA-seq, there was um, this term coined that I'm not particularly fond of, but it's just standard called differential expression. And the idea was that you'd have two conditions in an experiment and you would do a bulk RNA-seq experiment to so measuring on average um, among all the cells, the RNA content. And then you would ask, you know, what's different between condition A and condition B? And, you know, that's the simplest case. Maybe you have multiple conditions and you could do more complicated tests. Um, and again, this was done for RNA. Um, so it's not really protein expression. You know, often in the protein world, that's what expression really means. It really, it's sort of differential transcript abundance comparison. And a key thing to note is if you're trying to look at two groups and see what's different, you have to have some measure of the variability within each group to know if the difference you're seeing in some gene or another is significant. And so typically in bulk RNA-seq, you do a, a some rep, a, usually a handful of replicates uh, in one condition and in the other. This term has been carried forward to single cell RNA-seq where if you go back up here, um, you know, maybe cluster 14 is like condition A and cluster nine is condition B. And now you're asking, you know, what's different between them in the sense of, is there a gene that's significantly different? And where previously a replicate would have been, you redid the experiment to see the variability in your gene. Here, you're sort of thinking of a replicate as, as one of these cells. And this is really like a key issue with single cell RNA-seq because actually what you really ought to be doing and what they did in this paper because they're good scientists is to redo the whole single cell experiment um, in a different patient, right? And check what's the variability between patients between these two clusters of cell, you know, A and B. So it's not enough really just to look at one single sample. However, that's what almost everybody does. And it's not a terrible thing to do because if there are very, very stark differences, and there usually are between these cell types. That's why they clustered so far apart here. You can detect them by running one of these methods and treating each cell as a replicate. And today, because for the sake of the notebook running, we've done just one sample. And so we're gonna, um, and I hope your notebooks are finished by now. We're going to essentially do what I said, the latter thing, which is just look uh, between uh, the clusters. And I will just say one thing, you can also do the thing where you take maybe cluster 12 and instead of comparing them 
to one other cluster, you can compare them to the union of all of them. And that's asking what today is special about cluster 12 uh, as opposed to all other clusters. Um, okay, so how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. And uh, in this notebook, uh, we've used logistic regression, which is a standard method uh, for doing this kind of thing and also implemented in Sura. Um, and basically the output of such a method, any such method, and there are many of them, some people use the bulk RNAC tools like DSeq, is a list of genes with some p-values. And you have to be really careful about the p-values because what happens here is there are so many cells nowadays in these experiments that you have a lot of power to detect a very small difference. You know, if you sample a million, you know, infinitely many cells in each of your clusters, even the tiniest, tiniest perturbation between one to another in some gene is going to be like very, very significant with p-value, you know, 10 to the minus, I don't know what. So that's what happens in these tests. And so uh, p-values need to be taken with a grain of salt. There's also a separate problem, and there's literature about this, that you've kind of, you, you've kind of given birth to the chicken before the egg kind of thing, I will say it like that, because you cluster the data but basically using some heuristic method that tries to find cells that look different. And then you're going and asking, well, what's different about those cells? Well, obviously they're different because you try to find cells that are different, right? So there's some circularity there. And there's a very nice paper uh, by Shuram Khanan at the University of Washington in Seattle um, and, uh, and uh, Vasilis Janos, um, my former, um, uh, I don't know why I said Shuram, I apologize, by Vasilis Janos, my former postdoc with David Che, who worked on this with David Che, not with me, um, analyzing, um, you know, analyzing that, uh, that question. So once you get a list of genes, um, and, and this is really the fun part, you can paint these pictures, and, and, and we were painted the UMAP pictures, with the expression of the marker that you found by this differential analysis. And so here you can look at genes like IL-32, um, uh, you know, all sorts of different genes, uh, different markers, um, which uh, I think have come up uh, in a list that uh, Lambda inputted above. And you can see visually that they actually correspond to the cluster which is correspond. So it's a kind of nice QC for yourself. And maybe I, I've been really fixated on our notebook today, but if I go back to the paper, if we go down to where I think it's supplementary figure three. Um, let's go over there. Uh, you will see that they did this analysis, of course, um, looking at different uh, types of cells and looking for markers that are specific to them um, and making heat maps like this and modules. And, and if you go, um, and I won't do this now because I, we're already uh, in, into the lunch hour, you can look up these different genes and you can see that we have a very concordant analysis, which is what you would expect because we're looking at the same data. Hey, Lior. Yes, sir. Um, there are some people asking for the paper that you just mentioned about like clustering prior to differential expression. Um, um, that's a, a good question. Let me find um, the paper. We'll put it in the link of the video afterward. Uh, you know, what I'll do is um, if you just give me one second, I know the paper and um, I'm happy in real time. Um, uh, to try to find it and just post it on the chat. Um, so uh, let me see. Um, here it is. Um, I think, uh, let me, I think I can just send it to, how do I send it to everyone? There we go. Um, I think I've shared the, did you get the link? Yep. Thanks. Great. That's the paper and the authors are uh, Jesse Jang, uh, Kavinda Kamath and David Chin. Um, so I got all the authors wrong on this paper because I got confused. So I'm sorry I mentioned other former students and postdocs and people who had nothing to do with this work. My apologies. Um, we have another question, which yes. is a bit uh, in depth regarding um, the differential expression in these statistical tests. I'll just read it verbatim. Yes. As someone asked, is there any robust statistical method currently that can perform the differential analysis using similar designs as we have traditionally used in bulk RNA-seq, healthy versus disease designs, having replicates, and with a high number of cells? Any recommendations? 
Do current differential methods account for such covariate information in the matrix model while performing differential analysis in cell cluster differences that is not always seen? Um, you know, that's a really great question. And it's a question that is, um, is really uh, partly a research question because the short answer is that um, this has really not been fully developed um, in the setting of single cell RNA-seq. Having said that, um, there is a very nice paper um, by uh, Mark Robinson, who's, uh, uh, who's a very good uh, single cell, more general genomic statistician in, um, in Switzerland. And um, he has uh, uh, written a paper um, where he's uh, uh, looked at um, how to, you know, really thought through how one would, you know, do exactly this kind of more complex experimental design, um, how to effectively use replicates uh, in single cell RNA seq. Um, and uh, I'm uh, saying a lot of arms and arms because I'm trying to find again uh, the preprint um, uh, for you. Um, uh, yeah, let me try to I think I found the, the paper. It's a preprint actually. Um, in July last year. I'm not sure if it's been published, but no, I don't think so. So uh, let me, um, uh, sorry, give me one second. I found it, but the internet is a bit slow. Um, let me post it. Why am I having trouble? Oh, here we go. Thank you for your patience. Okay, yes. So I've sent you a preprint that discusses this question, uh, but I would add, which is a nice piece of work, but I would add that I think it's very much a, a research problem on how to do this in the best way. Any other questions? Nope. Fantastic. Okay, so, um, so one of the things that I haven't focused on today, but that's very nice in this collab notebook is that, that Lambda put together is she's tried to showcase a lot of the different kinds of plots you can make. So, you know, the, uh, these are nice plots where you can see um, the distribution and expression across cells in each cluster for specific genes. Um, you know, there's these pictures where you look at the graphical representation and you highlight a single gene or another. Um, so all of these are very nice ways to look at the data and worth your taking your time to learn them, which, um, which I think is a really nice thing to do. Um, this is another kind of visualization where again, oh, oh sorry. Um, sorry about that. Uh, dropped my iPad. Um, I think it may have gotten disconnected um, from the screen. Give me one second. Hopefully I didn't break the iPad, it looks okay. Sorry. Um, let me go back. I think am I back online? No, quite. Yeah, we can see your iPad now. Yeah, you can see my music selection. Very good. Um, great. Sorry about that. And I think we should be. No, I don't want to open that up. Uh, yeah. Let's go. I said not opening. Oh, there we go. No. No, I don't want to do that. Okay. Can you see the, um, can you see it again? Yes. Oh, you can see it. Wonderful. Great. Let me, um, something. Okay. Okay, so at this point, um, we, uh, you know, we have a very in-depth analysis in this notebook of the different cell types that were detected. And usually the annotation of their names is done from looking at which markers were identified in them. And, uh, and so you can identify the different cell types and name them. Um, that's what all of this large amount of code is doing here. And um, and then it's very nice because you can look at in one plot, I particularly like these kind of plots, you can look at the percent 
of cells that express a specific gene in a type of cell. And you can plot that alongside with the degree of expression. Um, so that's a very nice sort of uh, kind of plot to make um, to get a handle. And, um, you know, uh, this data set is really rich and interesting. And um, Lambda has gone through replicating cell type by cell type, the macrophages, um, all the kinds of cell types, like looking at uh, what the markers are and what percent are expressed and where are they expressed. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal thing that you've just done by a, a complete analysis of this single sample uh, in this way. Um, and by the way, you know, it would be really nice for this paper to have a notebook like this separately for each sample, because then you can just QC each sample very carefully um, uh, prior to doing a joint analysis of all the samples. So, you know, this is an immune paper, so they're looking at the macrophages and the T cells, all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to skip ahead um, to what's called uh, a GSEA analysis, which is another common type of analysis that's done which is that once you've picked out a set of differential genes for a cluster, you can ask, you know, what is it about these genes that, that tells me something about the biology? And this is called gene set enrichment analysis because when you're seeing certain kinds of genes, you can make guesses about active pathways. Um, you know, you can try to guess something functional about the cluster. Um, you know, one of the nice things about working about, you know, with these kind of data in modern times is that there's a huge literature, lots of tools that are implemented to do these kinds of analyses from bulk RNA-seq or even from the days of microarray gene expression analysis, because at this point you're looking at sets of genes and this has nothing to do with single cell. You're just asking, I have a set of genes I detected in some condition or in some, in somewhere. And, you know, what, it, what can I say about this? And so, this is again a material for a full course. There's CAG, gene ontology, all these, um, you know, all these uh, different databases and tools to access this. And in R, there's a super developed uh, you know, um, environment uh, for asking these kinds of questions. Um, a lot of this now is really basic stats and making sure you, that you're not um, phishing, uh, you know, p-value hacking, you know, trying things out till you get a good result. So you have to be very careful, uh, but there are very powerful tools um, that will allow you um, to make claims now about sets of genes. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to end around like 1230 now, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, from talking about this all in detail. Uh, but at this point of an analysis, you can have a picture like you started with, but really beautiful where everything's annotated nicely. You now don't just have clusters, but you know what they are. Um, you found the markers, you've done the gene set analysis, so you know what programs are active. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can look at it, of course, in TS in your UMAP. And now you're, you know, this is your atlas. Now you're ready to ask, you know, what's different between in a, in a setting where you've done a more complex design, like this one, you know, what's different between the patients, um, that are sick or not sick or between the tissue that's, you know, um, a lesion or, you know, adjacent. Um, all these kind of questions can now come into play. Uh, this is kind of the most basic part of getting the apples. Um, the genome that has become the default um, in the Santa Cruz genome browser is ACE2 for many obvious reasons because it's um, of interest for SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, you might ask, is it in this data set? Um, many people are writing papers and papers and papers nowadays, taking all the data sets that have been published in single cell and going and checking, you know, is the ACE2 receptor there in this cell type or that cell type? Uh, hopeful that that will lead to some insight about uh, which cells um, and which tissues SARS-CoV-2 infects. So you can look it up in this data set and it's as easy as, you know, tell me um, for this gene. Um, it, uh, the answer is no, it's, uh, I'll just make that cleaner. No, it's not detected even in the low quality cells. And this is where, you know, somebody asked initially, like, what do you filter? What do you leave? And I think it's very useful to have a notebook like this because although for your paper, you know, you filter out the, the garbage, 
it's a very different use case of single cell to try to figure out what's in the data versus to go back to a data set and say, does it ex show me that this gene is expressed? Because then you really just want to look at all the data and see, I mean, maybe it was in some low quality cells because it's very rare that I may have tossed otherwise. So I've been a little bit, you know, it, I will say like in a lot of the data sets right now, looking at uh, coronavirus related genes, they're taking the count matrices that were published as the sort of final post filtering analysis and doing work with that when really what people should be doing is going into the raw data each time, reprocessing it and really checking um, that, you know, uh, from, from the raw stuff. Um, so, uh, so that's the whole notebook, you know, I, I, uh, I've gone three times over the time it takes to run it. And um, so I think I'll end soon. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I know that you all have a lot going on and you're in work situations via Zoom and families. So this is uh, actually asking a lot of you to come in and, uh, and listen to us today. But we really appreciate it because we learned a lot from the last workshop. Uh, we got a ton of feedback and we would appreciate the same today. Uh, if you have anything to tell us about what we said and questions you ask, future workshops you're interested in, uh, we would love to hear from you. So I'll pause there and take uh, questions from Sina or Landa. Uh, and we should say questions from you via them. And they're also, of course, happy to answer questions. Yeah, we're just answering questions via the chat. Um, yes. I think one question is whether or not the questions and answers in the chat will be made available. And I think what we'll do is we will compile all of them after the workshop and make them available uh, via the, the GitHub page. Um, so people That's a great idea. We should do that probably for both of the um, yeah, tutorials that we've done. Yeah, there have been some excellent questions here today that um, really, really directly lead into research topics. I'm sorry, guys. I know there's a lot of questions being sent out, so just give us a moment and we'll get yeah, to it. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay online and try to field some of these. So there's questions about, uh, will we have future workshops on different aspects of single cell RNA-seq? And then an example would be like integrating public data sets. And That's I think a great question. Um, we were asked this last time. Um, yes, I think we have uh, from this experience today, but especially, I mean, this one's happening right now, but the last one we did, um, we felt that it was, uh, you know, pretty useful for us and for, you know, we got good feedback. Um, so I think this is a useful format for people. Um, you know, these first two have tried to cover a huge amount of territory because, um, I don't know, we just wanted to try and show people you could really go A to Z on a single cell analysis. Um, I think in the future, I, I personally like this format, and um, I do think we're going to, you know, host some some more workshops that maybe from now on will be much more targeted towards a very specific application or a specific question um, with very clearly delineated prerequisites, so that you know we're not just trying to show you an A to Z analysis. So the answer, the short answer, is yes, and um, I should also say that um, we're. We have some experience as a group now working with Colab. Uh, we have this repo. We're happy to um, provide access to anybody else who wants to post Colab notebooks there and facilitate you doing tutorials, um, teach you what we know, and uh, discuss the logistics of how we prepare to manage these. Uh, and, and I guess uh, to add to that as well, if you yourself uh, make a tutorial, um, we're happy to to review it and add it to the tutorials page on our website, which I will send out right now. Um, so this is a great way for everyone to contribute to the general knowledge of single cell processing. Um, another question someone had is that, is there going to be a workshop in isoform analysis? I, 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 we don't have specific plans for that, but that's a topic of great interest to us um, in my lab. And uh, I should have said also that I forgot, and I apologize, that um, these tutorials were based off initially um, workshop that was run uh, by Fan Gao, who's uh, the director of our bioinformatics uh, resource center at Caltech, um, uh, statistician Ingele Falkram's daughter, Sina Lambda, and myself. Um, earlier this year and also last year. And uh, we plan uh, in the future to do more of those in-person workshops, of course, um, social distancing permitting. 
uh, where we you know have whole days or even multi-day workshops uh, going into much more detail on a lot of these issues. But isoform analysis is of great interest in our lab, and so we may very well do another workshop on that. Absolutely. Um, so there's a, another question. So it seems like someone um, found our previous workshop useful and had used some of the code from those notebooks to do their own analysis, and they're asking what's the best way to uh, attribute um, sort of like uh, credit in that sense. Um, you know, we, it's 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 great. We're we're, we're appreciative. Um, it it would be um, fantastic if you credited the tools used in in the notebooks. Um, I think what we will do actually is that. Um, we can obtain DOI um, uh, identifiers uh, for the actual notebooks uh, via GitHub. Allows there's a, a process, I think, for that. Um, and actually, it's a good idea. We should do that. That will allow people, if they wish, to uh, to cite specific notebooks. Um, otherwise, it's fine um, to you know even an acknowledgement would just be super appreciated. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot them to the chat. Um, we'll stay on for a little bit longer. Um, but I think we're close to wrapping up, Lior. Um, yes, I think we're close to wrapping up. And like I said, if there are more questions, uh, you feel free to ask them by GitHub issues um, or in any of the formats where, uh, where I think we're generally pretty accessible um, to, to do these kind of things. Um, and I'll also say that uh, the previous tutorial we did led to a preprint um, that uh, that scene and I posted and I expect that this uh, tutorial um, will do will, will the same will happen. Um, we will we'll be posting a preprint based on our analysis. So um, so yeah. So that's another way uh, where you'll be able to access the information. Um, and we really appreciate your feedback. Um, you also feel free to email us if you have other suggestions or questions or concerns. Um, I want to thank especially Lambda um, for compiling this notebook and Sina for compiling the previous uh, notebook and uh, you know both of them today uh, for working hard. Uh, it's not easy to manage all the questions in real time. Uh, and all of you for attending on, on, your, on your busy day and in, in a difficult time. So thank you very, very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Um, I guess there's another question, uh, Lior, about yeah. uh, batch correction methods such as SCVI, which are based on supervised yeah. learning. Um, yes. So. Uh, there are a whole lot of tools, including some implementations in Surat, but also other tools uh, that um, allow one to both integrate different data sets, but their purpose is also um, to, uh, to account for batch effects that can happen in different experiments. Um, SCVI is a great tool from the Nir Yosef lab and Michael Jordan up at UC Berkeley based on uh, variational autoencoders. Um, there's other methods based on more uh, linear methods such as canonical correlation analysis. And it's really a topic that last time people asked us to give a workshop on and um, it would be great to do it. Um, if we find the time we will do it. Um, it's a complicated topic that's still very much um, a research topic, uh, but, uh, but a great question. My own personal um, uh, preference when it comes to looking at more complex um, experimental setups is insofar as possible it's best i think nowadays to use multiplexing methods um, uh, which there are many um, there's multi-seq from zev gardner's group site seek by rosa tija my own group uh, uh, work of jace garing published click tag method um, all these are published methods they have various advantages and disadvantages but they all work very well and they really are really good at handling batch effect because you label your samples somehow prior to pooling them in one experiment. So you're using the same library prep and the same PCR reactions and the same 10X instrument and it's the same person. And I really think that's a, 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 the right way uh, to go about um, you know, combining different samples rather than after the fact. But it, it still has to be done sometimes and I agree it would be an interesting um, uh, a topic. Um, uh, yes, and we will post uh, 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 somebody I just saw asked for the variational audit encoder paper, and I will be happy to post that. Um, or maybe, yeah, uh, let's see if I can find it. Oh. 
Um, there's another question um, on, uh, yeah, for double identification, is there a tool for cells from the same type? Yes. Um, okay, that's a good question. So there are cases of doublets, which we haven't discussed today. That's another issue, you know, that needs to be, um, uh, I can't find the link now, so maybe Sina or Lambda can do it. Uh, there are some long encoders. We have our own um, uh, paper on that topic as well. Um, yeah, so to go to the doublet detection, that's a very interesting problem where there are sometimes um, uh, cases where two cells were accidentally assayed in one droplet in these droplet-based methods. So where you think you're looking at one cell, but you actually have data from the pair. And there's a lot of methods to try to identify those. Um, you know, it, they're not usually, especially with the more modern methods that have been developed over the last few years, a lot of work has been put into minimizing that technical artifact. So it's not always a really big issue. Um, it can sometimes just be ignored. Uh, you know, I, as a general rule of thumb, there's so many technical issues in these experiments that if, if it's a kind of 1% issue, then I kind of think it's okay to just ignore it because there's just so many 1% issues going on. Uh, but there are methods to, uh, to detect doublets and it's an interesting uh, area to work in. And, uh, um, and I didn't discuss it today, I'm sorry, but there's, uh, um, but that's a good question. So, yeah. okay. So we're at twelve thirty-seven. Um, I'm going to thank everyone again um, for your time. Thank you so much, and I hope we will see some of you again. And I think we'll definitely have another one of these sometime. Uh, so thanks everybody, and uh, have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you all for joining.